Amen. Thank you. You may have your seats. Thank you so much. Um, it's such an honor. Let me just begin by saying how honored I am to be here uh, speaking at uh, this amazing church. I am a huge fan of Elevation Church. Uh, I'm a huge fan of this church. I am a huge fan of your pastors, Pastor Godman and Pastor Bola. Uh, these are just, they are such amazing people. Every time I'm with them, something rubs off. We have learned a whole ton of things from you. We love, we love their big heart. And we know it's the heart of this church, to impact churches beyond yourself. And you are having not just a local uh, uh, Lagos uh, impact, not just national Nigeria impact, but you're having a global impact as a church. And we just want to say how honored we are to be here, uh, to spend some time with you. You know, if, you're, if the father of the house has a global anointing, the anointing is for everybody in the house. Uh, you cannot be local and be part of this church. I speak it over, you cannot be local and be part of this church. The anointing of this house is a global anointing. And I am grateful. I don't hear some amens. I'm, the, 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 the people in Kenya seem to want to steal your blessings. Don't, don't, allow them, don't allow them to steal your blessing in your house. <laughs> wow, wow. They're hungry for your blessings. As you heard, I'm here with my wife, Pastor Carol. We've been married for 28 years. And uh, uh, she's my soulmate. Uh, we have three children, all of them in university. Uh, one of them is actually here, our first one. Uh, so if you could just stand and wave, that's our first daughter. And uh, we're grateful that she is now serving uh, as an intern in one of our churches. Our prayer is that all our children will serve the Lord. Uh, that, that really is our desire. And what, what we say is, you cannot serve the Lord and your children don't serve the Lord. Uh, whatever career they go into, our prayer is that our children will love and serve God and exceed us. And that really is a prayer of every parent, isn't it? That your children will do greater things than yourself. And like I said, I, um, I, I'm, I'm even afraid to, these guys will embarrass me if I introduce them. But anyway, I've, I've brought some other, my spiritual children as well, uh, who are here. If you could just stand and wave. Uh, so... These are, these are pastors uh, from Mavuno Church. Uh, many of them lead several congregations. Uh, they, are, they oversee uh, different congregations. Some of them oversee multiple uh, congregations. And they're also our disciples. And so we're grateful to have them here with us. So thank you. We love you. Thank you so much. You know, I, I really do believe that God is creating a strong connection between East and West in this season. And that there's some things that we need from one another. I sat next to a Nigerian pastor on the flight. And uh, she was coming from London, so connected through Nairobi. Hadn't been to Kenya. And I asked her, what's your impression of Africa, oh, of, of Nairobi, of Kenya? And it was what I expected because it was completely based on the fact that everything she knows about Kenya, she's received from Western media. And unfortunately, the colonialists structured our continent so that we actually are suspicious of each other and we think all good things are to be found where they are. And so it's actually easier for me to go and learn in London and fly over Nigeria to get there. And I think that is wrong because God has made Africa the richest continent. We need to understand that God is doing some powerful things here. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I have a spiritual daughter who is Nigerian, and the first time I met her, she was so afraid to come to Kenya. She married one of my sons, and I asked her, why were you afraid? She said, I expected to find animals everywhere, and, and people living in huts, and, and child soldiers. I was afraid that somebody would kidnap my children and turn them into child soldiers. I said, that is so tragic. Uh, so I thought, today I'll show you a few pictures of, of Nairobi and of Kenya. Just so that you begin to understand that it's a nice place. It's a place worth visiting. Uh, it's an amazing place. It's a really beautiful, beautiful country. And so I'd love to invite you all to come and visit us in Kenya. Next time, don't go to London. Come to Kenya. You'll find some beautiful things uh, to see in our country. You know, it's interesting because um, we are nations that are very young. We tend to beat ourselves up and to say, oh my goodness, in Kenya, we have a hashtag, only in Kenya. It's not a positive thing. We're saying bad things only happen in this country. And I keep telling my countrymen, we are only 60 years in independence. We're only 60 years as nation states. Never compare Africa with any other part of the world. 
because they talk about the Asian tigers. The Asian tigers were countries, cohesive nations before colonialism. We were not the countries that we are. We were stitched together with arbitrary boundaries that cut across people groups. And yet 60 years later, here we are. Here we are. Go to England and ask them where they were 60 years after 920 AD when, when they were founded. There were still villages. They had very little going for them. It took them hundreds of years to get to where they are today. You go to America and ask them where they were after 1776. Uh, <laughs> they were nowhere. A hundred years into their independence, they were having the civil war. So how dare they lecture us and tell us we're uncivilized? Africa is not uncivilized, we're emerging. We're emerging. And we need to start seeing the beautiful things that God has put in our continent. Because we need to stop being pessimistic. I'm not a pessimistic African, I'm a very optimistic African. I believe that in our lifetime, we're going to see things that will make our, our will, that will shock us. Uh, and even the things we're living in today would have shocked the people who are our parents and our grandparents. And the progress is moving at a dizzying pace. It's unprecedented. No other part of the world has had this kind of move, of change in living conditions of its people uh, within the lifetime of its people. And so I want to just uh, say that we need each other. Africans, we need each other. You need what gifts we have in East Africa. And we need what gifts you have in West Africa. And I believe that the time is coming when Jesus is starting to connect his church across this continent so we can share those gifts. Because what we have is what the world needs. Christianity is dying across the world. It's time for reverse missions. It's time for us to go and reach them. Not just reach our own people, but start churches that reach those people the same way that we were reached in a generation past. Now, allow me to just mention that I have a couple of books, I think, still left from Exponential. Uh, I don't want to go back home with them, so I think it's important for me to mention them. Uh, there's one called Seasons, and I think I didn't talk about them earlier, so maybe people didn't understand that these are my favorite books. Um, Seasons talks about the important uh, stages of a leader's life. Um, every leader needs to understand what is, what is your important task in your 20s? What are the things you need to be doing in your 20s or in your teens? in your 30s, in your 40s. Because when you don't understand your season, then you don't plan your life accordingly. Psalm 90.12, Moses says that, isn't he? he? He talks about the fact that, you know, you need to understand how to plan. Uh, if we have insight, we're able to plan our life all right. And so Seasons is about that. It talks about what stages you need to have. Uh, fearless is really my story. Um, I learn a lot more from leaders' stories than I do from theories. Stories are powerful because they tell you the leader's mistakes, tell you what they learned, how they learned them. And so because I'd been so blessed to learn about many founding pastors, many people and many leaders of, uh, I, I, I read biographies a lot. And so I thought I'm going to actually add my story. I don't know if Pastor Godman has his biography yet. If he doesn't, he needs to have it uh, because that's a story that's going to bless many people on this continent. And so that's what Fearless is about. So if you're interested, those I think are going to be at the back. Now, today, when, uh, I want to say when PG asked me to speak, um, I said yes before I even thought. And then I went and asked the Lord, what shall I speak about? And then he told me something that I didn't want to speak about. And I thought, oh, God, give me something nice. Uh, I, wa I want to be liked by these people. I don't know if you ever get that. When God tells you to say something, you're like, oh, man, okay. <laughs> so what I want to talk about is when good people do nothing when good people do nothing. Um, and I'm going to be, just, just, to, uh, just so that you know, I'm going to be talking about politics and governance uh, because that's something that is close to my heart as well. When it comes to politics and governance, many Christians in Kenya are more likely to keep their distance than be involved. I'm going to speak about Kenya just because I don't know as much about Nigeria. And whatever is not helpful, just throw it out. Whatever connects, then you can connect with it. Amen. So in Kenya, people don't, Christians don't get uh, involved in politics. I'm sure Nigeria is very different. Amen. <laughs> so many Christians in my nation, they see politics as a dirty game. Something to be left to dirty people. People who go to see witch doctors. People who are only thinking about themselves. And Christians don't want to dirty themselves with engaging in this dirty game. Now... 
Many Christians would even not think of politics as something to preach us on a Wednesday prayer service. Seriously, Pastor, what are you thinking about? You should be talking about how to grow our faith. And many Christians, even in my part of the world, would think this is not the type of topic that you bring to a service. There are many reasons why we think this way as Christians. I, I just want to start with just, I'm going to share just three tonight, uh, as African Christians specifically. The first is leadership abuse. Leadership abuse. You see, during the colonial period, the government set up leadership structures as a tool to subjugate the subjects. The structures of leadership were not meant to help enhance the lives of those colonized. It was meant to extract from them everything and to amass power for a few to rule over the masses. It's interesting because these same colonizers came from places where, the gov- where they themselves had fought to overthrow oppressive powers that had op- oppressed them. But when they came here, they did exactly the same to us. It's very ironic. Uh, at the same time that the World War was going on and Europe and, and, and especially particularly England was fighting against this oppressive man called Hitler and have painted a picture of us in history that he oppressed the Jews and had concentration camps to kill them in their masses and to torture them. England was doing exactly the same thing in my nation of Kenya. They were running concentration camps just as bad as Hitler's. And today, I mean, there's a book out, if, you ever, if you're one of those historians, it's called The British Gulag. And it was written by an MIT professor. She came to Kenya and interviewed a lot of old people who were alive at that time. She said she would talk to a 90-year-old grandmother and ask her her story. And the woman, 90 years old, would break into tears. Traumatized generation. Uh, these grandparents who experienced the horrors of colonialism. Politics in Africa. Unfortunately, after independence, our leaders adopted the same principles of the people who taught them what politics is meant to be about. Politics in Africa is seen as a struggle for power at any cost. And it is expected that those who have power will use their positions to enrich themselves and maybe a few of their tribesmen. In election years, we read almost daily in the papers about community leaders from this community or that community saying that they've been marginalized for too long. It's time for their people to eat. And as a result, many Christians have chosen to take a back seat rather than be involved in such a dirty game. Again, this could just be happening in Kenya. But it's not just a dirty game. We also think of it as too complicated. We've been taught to think of it as too complicated. And I think this is part of the conspiracy to take away power from African peoples. That's why we leave the game to politicians, the people who can understand it. Because for us, we think this is too complicated. And yet Aristotle, the Greek philosopher, stated that man is by nature a political animal. Politics is not just about ruling nations. Politics is how we organize ourselves. Whether it is in business, in academia, in social or religious spaces, even within the family, that politics is how we govern ourselves so that we can have a better life together. In other words, if you participate in a neighborhood committee, a security committee to talk about how do we keep some security, some semblance of security in our neighborhood, that's politics. That's politics. If you come together with your church small group, to help educate some poor children in your community. That's politics. That's politics. You see, our our limited definition has meant that politics is very shallow on our continent because people have not learned to work together to solve their community's problems. And so in my country, we have a, a saying that is, I pray that the government... It's just a saying. It actually stands by itself. I pray that the government... In Swahili, you say, Naomba Serikali. What that means is one day the government will solve our plight. There are poor children in this area. We pray the government one day will do something about it. We have lost agency to organize to solve our problems. And we've reduced politics to voting for national leaders and then praying for the next five years that they leave us alive at the end of their term. And this is just the robbery of what we call leadership abuse. The second reason why many Christians will stay away from politics is religious misguidance. Religious misguidance. Many of the huge advances and progress in the West were brought about by people of faith, 
living out their faith. I don't have time to go into individual stories. But when you walk around, you're going to find in Europe that there were great hospitals that were brought up to treat the sick. Hospices to care for the dying. University education. Great uh, universities that were brought up by people of faith. Charity organizations. The belief in human rights and self-worth. All these in their cultures were actually the result of people of faith. Faith for them was an organizing thing that lifted people up from despondency and helplessness and left them in a better place. But in Africa, religion seems to mostly have been reduced to being about spiritual renewal and personal advancement. It's this thing that we do. We go to church, we become experts in spiritual disciplines, in prayer, in reading scriptures, in fasting, attending worship services. There's nothing wrong with those things. But that's not all that Jesus came for. I tell people in my church that Jesus did not come to take us to heaven. Jesus came to help us rule the earth. And the first commission, Genesis chapter 1 verse 28, he says, he, he picked them up, made them in his image, male and female, says, rule over the earth, subdue it. All the fish, he says, you know, he says, all those fish, all those birds, rule over them. And I always tell people, when Jesus came back, he didn't just come for spiritual salvation. He came to restore the rule back to the people who had lost it. He came to give us rule over the earth. You know, the faith that missionaries brought and that we practice is different from the faith that reformed their own nations. They brought us half a faith. And the problem is that the devastation you see in Africa is a result of preaching salvation without the kingdom of God. There's nothing short of spiritual misdirection. I go to Europe and sometimes I moan because I see what the reformers brought and then I wonder why it didn't happen. Uh, there's, a, there's a mission station in my country. It was run by the Germans for a long time. It's an evangelistic mission sta station. They preach all over the country. They've brought the gospel to many. And I really love that, that they've done that. They're they are pioneering missionaries. But the amazing thing is when I go to their mission station, Germans are phenomenal at using their hands. They know how to build from anything. They can make solar panels from the sand in the river. I mean, they can make electricity from a little, a little well that is running. I mean, a, a little waterfall, and they make electricity. And one of the days I had a chat with one of my, my missionary friends. I said, you have taught the gospel over this, in this country for many years. But in none of those places did you teach those people the skills that you have in your hands. You're teaching them half a gospel. And that's the problem in Africa is we have half a gospel. The third reason Christians shy from spiritual engagement is national miseducation. National miseducation. School systems all over Africa were not developed for our prosperity. The school systems here were based on the mentality that the brightest and the best would be trained to serve the West. And so we, we, we had this system that took all the best students and gave them jobs, working in, as clerks and working in the offices where the, the colonial masters ruled. And what happened is after colonialism, the mentality remained so that our brightest, instead of being used, trained to use their brains and their resources to empower and uplift fellow Africans, we are teaching our children to look for multinational jobs and to make riches for themselves and not to solve the problems of their societies. As a result, many of us have relatives or fellow citizens in rural areas where we come from that are living in poverty. And yet our MBA in strategic management is of no use to solve the problem of no dirty water in the village and children without mal uh, malnourished children in our village. All this education, but no solutions. What I'm saying is that education should make you a change agent. It's supposed to help you create solutions for the people around you. That's what it's meant to do. You know, we went to school, we're taught to cram as much as we could so we could get jobs that would make us as rich as we could be. I, I, is Nigeria like Kenya? It, yeah, that's what we're taught. We're taught don't even collaborate. This is about you being number one. 
and you going ahead. In Kenya, we have this little thing. When I show Kenyans this, I don't know if Nigerians know this, but in Kenya, we have this little thing. It's very funny. It's a Kenyan thing. We have this thing when you're writing exams that you do this. <laughs> you guys do it as well. <laughs> you don't share with anybody else. This is your knowledge. So you can be number one in class. You can go to a good university and beat everybody else and build your big house and put a big fence around it so all the poor people don't come and take the things that you have. My goodness, that is miseducation. Albert Einstein said, a person does not need to go to college to learn facts. He can learn them from books. The value of a college education is to train your mind to think. To think. But you know, Africans, we, we train our minds to cram. In my country, we do exams, and then the Form 4 students, they ban the books. They have a book burning ceremony after exams. <laughs> because it's like, we're done. Now we can get good jobs. And they don't understand. No, no, no. It was not about cramming for exam. It was about creating a mind that can think for your fellow villagers. To pull them up and uplift them from poverty. My goodness. I told you, this, one, this was the sermon I told God, please, I don't want to preach this. The next. I want these people to like me. It's, I've not been here for so long. And I'm worried. <laughs> wow. Wow. You know, because of these kinds of factors, as African Christians, we've taken a back seat when it comes to politics and governance. We've let other people take the reins of our nations, take the reins of our cities, We've left the unrighteous to rule. At the very best, we have prayer meetings for our national leaders. But other times we grumble and criticize and wonder what misfortune allowed us to live in a place like this. But most of the time, we keep quiet and mind our own business. While the business of our nations and cities and neighborhoods is run down by selfish and corrupt individuals. And I want us tonight to turn to Judges chapter 9. Very briefly, I want to look at a passage there that is illuminating to us. I believe this is a passage that was put in this, in this book specifically for African peoples. I think this is one of those passages that I read and I see myself in it. I see my continent in it. Judges chapter 9. It's a story of Gideon. And if you know anything about Gideon, he was a powerful man, a warrior, a man who God used to win a battle over 10,000 people with just 300. You know the story of the 300. And he had a huge army and God said, you don't need all of them. I can deliver you with few. And so Gideon, the heroic man, he got his 300. And they went and God did such a powerful thing that they destroyed 10,000 Midianites. And Gideon became a national hero. And he became this man that was known as one of the judges of Israel. But one of the things that many people don't know about Gideon is that he had many wives who gave him 70 sons. I mean, why do people laugh at Africans? I mean, that's a lot of children. 70 sons. I don't know how many people you know that have 70 sons. That's a lot of sons. With the 70 sons, as if that was not enough, he also had a concubine who gave him one more. It's like 70 plus one. <laughs> and this one is the only one we get to know his name. His name was Abimelech. And you know what happened is this man had, a, this woman was foreign, so she was not accepted by his, by, her, by his people. And of course, she's a concubine among the wives, so she's kicked out. And after Gideon dies, he doesn't feel welcome, so he goes back to the people where his mother came from. And that's where we read this story in Judges chapter 9. It's a very, like I said, this is an African story. Read it like an African and just see what God may be saying to us as a people of this great continent. It's a bit of a long passage. I'm going to read the 21 uh, verses. And it says, Abimelech, son of Jerubal, went to his mother's brothers in Shechem and said to them, and to all his mother's clan. So he's going back home. He's going to the village. Do Nigerians go to the village? In, in Kenya, we live in the city, but we go to the village. Is that, is that, I think it's an African thing. So he's going to the village to talk to his fellow villagers, his mother's clan. He says, ask all the citizens of Shechem, which is better for you? To have all 70 of Jerubal's sons rule over you or just one man? Remember, I'm your flesh and blood. 
Are you seeing some Africans there? Yeah, 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 I'm your tribe. You vote for me because, not because I have merit or because I've done anything for you, but I'm your man. I'm your man. If one of us is in power, then all of us will be in power, right? <laughs> That's what they tell us. When the brothers repeated all this to the citizens of Shechem, they were inclined to follow Abimelech. For they said, he's related to us. Wow. They gave him 70 shekels of silver from the temple of Baal Berith. And Abimelech used it to hire reckless scoundrels who became his followers. He went to his father's home in Oprah and on one stone murdered his 70 brothers, the sons of Jerubal. But Jotham, the youngest son of Jerubal, escaped by hiding. Then all the citizens of Shechem and Bel Milo gathered beside the great tree at the pillar in Shechem to crown Abimelech king. When Jotham was told about this, he climbed on the top of Mount Gerizim and he shouted to them, Listen to me, citizens of Shechem, so that God may listen to you. One day the trees went out to anoint a king for themselves. And they say to the olive tree, be our king. But the olive tree answered, should I give up my oil, by which both gods and humans are honored to hold sway over the trees? Next, the tree said to the fig tree, come and be our king. But the fig tree said, should I give up my fruit so good and sweet to hold sway over the trees? Then the tree said to the vine, come, be our king. But the vine answered, should I give up my wine, which cheers both gods and humans to hold sway over the trees? Finally, all the trees say to the thorn bush, come and be our king. And the thorn bush say to the trees, if you really want to anoint me king over you, come and take refuge in my shade. But if not, then let fire come out of the thorn bush and consume the cedars of Lebanon. Have you not acted honorably and in good faith? Have you acted in honorably and in good faith by making Abimelech king? Have you been fair to Jerubal and his family? Have you treated him as he deserves? Remember, my father fought for you and risked his life to rescue you from the hands of Midian. But today you have revolted against my father's family. You have murdered his 70 sons on a single stone and have made Abimelech the son of his female slave king over the citizens of Shechem because he's related to you. So have you acted honorably and in good faith towards Jeroboam and his family today? If you have, may Abimelech be your joy and may you be his too. But if you have not, let fire come out from Abimelech and consume you, the citizens of Shechem and Beth Milo. And let fire come out from you, the citizens of Shechem and Beth Milo, and consume Abimelech. And after he said these words, I'm sure they were in shock. They were listening to him. They, they, were, they were still captivated. At this point, there's chaos. People are running towards him. And verse 21 says, Then Jotham fled, escaping to Beer, and he lived there because he was afraid of his brother Abimelech. Wow. I see three reasons in this passage why it is not optional for us as God's people to engage in political action. It is not an option. It is not an option. And here are three very good reasons why. Number one, because we don't have a choice. We don't have a choice, God's people. You know, it's very clear in this story that the citizens of Shechem were not there at the time that Jotham was killing his brothers. They were running their business. They were doing their thing. They were, they were raising their children. All they had done was raise his campaign fund because he was their relative. They supported his campaign because he was one of them. It was those reckless adventurers that he used their money to hire. Those are the ones who committed murder, who did, who, who did a coup and took over the nation. And those are the ones that if asked, you know, it, it's interesting, if you asked Abimelech's uncle and his relatives, they'd have said, it wasn't us. We were just doing our thing. We're not the reason that there's problems in this country. We're not the ones who caused all the chaos. It's the leaders up there in State House. They're the ones who are causing the problems. It's not us. We're just minding our own business. But Jotham would not let them get off that easily. 
When the good trees are too busy to give leadership, the bad trees are allowed to do so. That's what this passage is saying. When the good trees, when the good people are too busy minding their own business to get involved in political action, the thugs take over. The Abimelechs take over. And all across Africa, Abimelechs are running governments. They are running governments. Because all the great leaders, all the good people are sitting in church, running their business, not interested in the fate of of their nations. And as a result, what these people did not know is one day they'd be forced to abandon those same businesses and serve that thorn bush to escape fire and destruction. In other words, when we abandon politics to the unrighteous, we will face the consequences with everybody else. Now, I hope you're not listening to this like saying, why is he talking to Nigerians? I'm talking to my own people. These, Ken these Kenyans are the ones I'm preaching to. Because obviously these problems are not your problems, people of Nigeria. So just listen in and feel sorry for us, okay? Just feel sorry for us. Because these are the problems we face. I'm sure you don't identify. <laughs> you know, African Christians, we often tolerate evils in society that we ought not to tolerate. From the genocide in Rwanda in 1994 to South Africa being oppressed by decades of apartheid. In each of those regimes, there were strong Christian movements, strong churches, that if only had stood up for what was right and just, people would not have been oppressed. People would not have lost their lives. Nations would not have been dragged down by, by demons that they're still trying to exercise many years later. You know, it's been said that in Kenya, when a road becomes impassable, because of potholes. Rich people on that road just buy bigger cars that don't fill the potholes. And those who can't afford the big car, they just leave earlier because it's going to take them longer to get to work. So we adjust around injustice. We sort our lives, we get our lives to just manage the situation. Instead of asking a question and saying, why is this happening? How do we in this neighborhood organize to change this, to create solutions? What we do is we organize around evil. We, we, we adjust around evil. Everybody finds an individual solution. When there's no electricity, everybody buys a generator. And nobody asks, why is there no electricity in, one of the, in the country with the best oil that is of highest demand in the world? Why is there no electricity? You know, I'm surprised. I mean, you need to know this, Nigerians. In Kenya, we hardly ever have blackouts. Hardly ever. Nobody has a generator in their house. People would think you're crazy if you had a generator in your house. Why? It's a waste of money. Use your money for something useful. People with, people with generator might be a businessman who runs a printing press, something which cannot afford a blackout. But none of these people have a generator in their house. <laughs> Yeah. And yet, you're the richest economy in Africa. This is the biggest and the richest economy in Africa. Christians need to be asking, why is this? How can this be? How can this be passed on to our children? Somebody must do something about it. Edmund Burke, 18th century British parliamentarian and orator, he once said, all that is necessary for the forces of evil to win in the world is for enough good men to do nothing. When good men do nothing, evil always wins. When Christians are too busy to engage in governance in our nation and our communities, no wonder politics becomes the dirty game it is. And is it possible that one day we'll go to heaven expecting celebration and find God asking us hard questions about the state of our nations? And says, what did you do with the place I left you to rule? What did you do with your responsibility? Number two, reason why we can't, why we cannot ignore politics. Number two is because it affects our greatness. It affects our greatness. We were made for greatness, God's people. We were made to rule. When you're, when you're told you're a ruler, that's a great thing. But it affects our greatness. When God's people are carried off into Babylon, God used the prophet Jeremiah to speak some very powerful words to them. He said to them in Jeremiah 29 verse 7, Seek the peace and prosperity of the city in which I've carried you into exile. And he says, pray for it because if it prospers, 
you too will prosper. You too will prosper. You see, our prosperity and our greatness is tied up with the place where we live. If it prospers, we prosper. If Kenya prospers, you, if Nigeria prospers, you prosper. We prosper. You know, it's interesting because the city that God, they were being asked to pray for was a city full of idols. It was a city full of oppression. It was a city full of the spoils of war. It was a city of the colonialists. The place where they would say, how can I sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Why would I want to worship God in a God-forsaken place? But God says, not so. Seek the peace and prosperity of that nation. As much as you despise it. Because if it prospers, you too will prosper. You know, many Nairobians, do you use the word Lagosians? Because we, we say Nairobians. Many Nairobians are what we call absentee tenants. Our houses are strictly bed and breakfast affairs. Because we commute to go to the office to work. And we come back through traffic in the evening to sleep there. Many of us really don't concern ourselves with the issues around the houses where we live. Because we know that this is just a temporary abode. That as I get promoted, I will move into a nicer neighborhood. And as I get even more promoted, I'll go to the nice neighborhood. And eventually I'll get to a neighborhood that does not have potholes and problems and blackouts. And so I don't worry about those things. I'm too busy making the money to move out of those problems. And leave them for the people who have no choice but to endure them. <sighs> God is telling us. Work for the prosperity of where I have put you in right now. Even if you feel like you're in exile in that place, it's not the place you want to live in. You wish God had allowed you to live in a nicer area. Work for the prosperity of the place that I've put you in. Pray for it. Because if it prospers, you prosper. Your children prosper. Your family prospers. You know, it's interesting because Jesus said, Whoever wants to be great must be the servant of all. Winston Churchill said the price of greatness is responsibility. If we don't see it as our duty to serve those among us in our neighborhoods, we can never really be great. God put us on earth to serve. You're a citizen of heaven, God's people. You are an ambassador to another nation. You're not built simply for the place you're in, but you're put in there for the sake of the place you're in. You're here to represent the government of heaven on the streets of earth. And your prayer every morning is, may your kingdom come. Where? Not in heaven. <laughs> it's already there. Your role is to pray and bring down the kingdom of, earth, of heaven on earth. So that what is happening on earth is equivalent to what is happening in heaven. There are no blackouts. In heaven. There are no potholes in heaven. There are no children without food in heaven. And whose job is it to bring this kingdom down? It's my job. It's my job. I don't live for the things of this world. You know, the things of this world are very deceptive. The Bible tells us that the streets of heaven are made of gold. But many of us spend our whole lives chasing gold, chasing currency, chasing the things that one day we are created to walk on. In heaven, nobody will ever care what you came in with. All the resources God gives you on this earth are to do his will. And his will is to uplift the lives of the people he's put you among. And that's why we must be involved in political action. Because when we don't, it affects our greatness. A Kenyan theologian, Professor George Kinoti, said, It is wrong for Christians to sit back and let others do all the fighting and the hard work. And then when success has been achieved, to jump in and enjoy the fruit of others' blood and sweat. Christians must be at the forefront of the struggle for the peace and prosperity of Africa. I believe this with all my heart. As a follower of Jesus, I'm the one who's passionate the most that this nation would prosper. Number three reason why we must be engaged in political action is that because God expects it. God expects it of all of us. Matthew chapter 5 verse 13 says, You're the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it useful again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. We are salt. In the Bible, salt was a vital commodity. 
It was used for flavoring food. It was the only available preservative. When you rubbed it on the meat, the meat would not go bad. There were no fridges in those days. And so salt was the preserving force of all the food that was there in the ancient world. Farmers would slaughter their animals, rub salt into the meat until it was preserved. Nothing could come and touch it. Microbes could not decompose it. Now, just as meat by itself exposed to the natural elements will decay, so society by itself exposed to the evils of this world will decay. There's no society that gets better by itself. Every society you travel to, somebody paid the price for where they are. Somebody paid the price. Every place you go to in the world that is working, somebody paid the price. And it's an inevitable process that unless Christians are part of this culture, penetrating and preserving it from the inside, making it have a good flavor, then this society will decay. It will decay. That's, we have to do it because God wants us. He put us here to do it. Now, the Bible tells us that this prophecy actually came true. Jotham's prophecy came true. Because what happened is Abimelech eventually turned against the people of Shechem. When he became powerful enough, he didn't want any other forces around him because he didn't want people opposing him. So the same relatives who put him into power, he oppressed them terribly. He destroyed their city. He killed all its inhabitants and he scattered salt in their farm so that nothing could ever grow again. So-called my people. He was really just using them. He was just using them. And this business people were now destroyed by the very monster their silence helped to create. And this is a danger we face as African Christians. That if we are just quiet, or if we support people because they're from our tribe and don't worry about what they represent, we don't think for ourselves to ask what kind of leaders do our nations lead, we will, we will be burnt up by the very people that we ignored. All that is necessary for the forces of even enough good men and women to do Nothing. And I want to say today that it's time for Christians to get involved in governance and politics. It's time for us. It doesn't matter what your profession is. You know, some people say that's not my mountain. It's someone else's mountain. Politics is for all of us. You cannot avoid it. Wherever you live, you can start to involve yourself in political action. I believe it's time for us to have a long-term perspective on this political process. Africa desperately needs a new type of leaders, men and women of integrity and ability, who have refused to enrich themselves and their tribes, and who have said uh, that I'm here for the well-being of all fellow citizens. In the words, again, of Professor George Kinoti, we African Christians must correct the mistakes made by an earlier generation and seek to apply the whole word of God to the whole of life and play an active part in bringing peace and prosperity to Africa. God's people, this is what God wants of us. We must begin to seek the peace and prosperity of Nigeria. In my country, a long time, people fled. The lines around the U.S. Embassy were layers deep. And all the planes coming into Kenya were empty. All the ones leaving were going out. And, you know, I, I say this. I say there's some things you can do to begin to change the situation. And one of the things that happened in Kenya is we had one election when the country did not vote for its tribal king. It didn't vote for the person who they thought was helpful. They voted as a person for an opposition candidate. This man was the least likely person. He was old. He, was, he looked senile. He had had an accident, so even his words were slurred. But he was, the, the country decided we're going to vote, and somehow, by God's grace, we voted for this person. He turned out to be the liberator of our, continent, of our country. And across Kenya, you ask anybody, they'll tell you, this man changed the trajectory of our nation. After 24 years of dictatorship, we finally had somebody who decided they were not going to live for themselves, but they were going to turn around and live for this nation. In one 10-year term, I mean, in two, two five-year five terms that were 10 years, our country moved from a place where it had negative 3% growth rate to the place by the time he was leaving, our growth rate had topped 10% uh, at some points. Uh, this man changed our country. He brought pride back into Kenyans. Uh, and he, he, it was incredible. I mean, all, all the money that Kenyans had hidden abroad came back into the country. 
built our stock exchange. Our companies were bought by Kenyans in the local stock exchange. It changed the, I tell you, it changed. If you come to Kenya, somebody told me recently they were in Kenya in 2000, around 2002. And I said, if you came today, you would not believe that country. It's not the same country. The pictures I showed you are not our reality. But what happens is people decided enough was enough. And something began to shift. What are things you can begin to do as God's people? Number one is prayer. Don't underestimate the power of your prayer. Prayer is how we bring the kingdom down. Let your kingdom come, Lord, in Nigeria as it is in heaven. Ah, the voices of Nigeria must rise every day and call the kingdom of God down. We open the portal for God. God will not do it without us. He waits for man to invite him into the affairs of this universe. We must invite him onto our planet. He's given us. The heavens belong to God, but the earth is our responsibility. And one of the first ways we do that is through prayer. First Timothy 1, uh, uh, first Timothy 2, verse 1 to 2, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in godliness and holiness. So that's the first thing. Let's pray. God's people, let's pray. Kenya's, Kenya's trajectory changed by one election. None of us believed it. The scripture says on that day, we were as men who dreamed. The whole country was in a celebration. Everybody was on the street hugging one another. Different tribes. Because it, the impossible became possible. God can change the trajectory of this nation with just one event. That's how powerful he is. You cannot give up hope in this God that we serve. We cannot become helpless. We must believe in the God that we're praying for. He's more powerful than any force that is in the, against this nation. Number two, look. Number two is look. We must look. Open our eyes. What are the oppressions and injustices around you? What are those things that make you mad in your neighborhood? What are those things that you just clench your fists and you wish you could do something about it? You're so mad, you, you wish somebody would do something about it. Some of you, it's, it's oppression of women. Some of you, it's children being mistreated. You see that on TV, you feel like crying every time you see it. Some of you, it's, it's, it's the trash you see on the street or the pothole on the road and you're like, somebody needs to do something about this. Well, guess what? You'll be surprised that not everybody feels the same thing that you feel. Yeah. Some people are so passionate about the girl child. They feel like if only something could happen to help girls in this country. Let me just see. Anybody passionate about the girl child? Just keep your hands up. Keep, keep your hands up. I want you to look around you, those who put up your hands. Because you thought the whole church was passionate, right? Shock on you. Not everybody thinks like you. The fact that you have that thought should probably tell you God put it in you and not in your neighbor. And he's waiting for you to deliver on the passion he has placed in your heart. So open your eyes. What are those things you are passionate about that others are not? And it's time for you to begin to pray specifically that God would give you solutions for those things. Number three, organize. This, this, this thing, I call it the, how do, you, how do you plod? Because this thing will not happen overnight. You need a long-term perspective. So the third step is just begin to organize. Somebody say, don't agonize, organize. The solution to the problems in our nation is simply just people just need to start to organize. Come together with others. Don't work alone. You cannot solve the problems alone. And as churches, we have the infrastructure to organize. We have our small groups. We have people who have like mind. We have prayer groups that we can pray with. As we just begin to say, let's organize. Even if it's let's organize prayer. Let's organize a solution for just our small neighborhood. Something begins to happen when God's people come together. Genesis 11 verse 6, it says, If as one people speaking the same language, they begin to do one thing. Nothing will be impossible for them. God in heaven himself said those words. And so it's possible as you begin to organize that God begins to move. And we move from short-term to long-term thinking. I have a desire and have a dream that in a, a short while to come, that the president of Kenya will not be elected just the way people think. We'll be elected through our grassroots actions as a church of that nation. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. Because what happens is we can start in our local community. And we get together as a small groups in that local community and say, who is a good leader that we trust in this place? 
And we start to say, we want this person to be the person. But if there's another big church next door, they can do the same process. And the next church does the same process. And the seven churches bring their candidates to the bishops of those churches. And the bishops spend time in prayer. And they say, this is the one. Do you understand if the bishops did that, we would not even need an election? The congregations of those churches would pick the local representative. That's what it means to organize. I'm not giving you theory. This is what we're doing back home. This is a process we're getting into back home. So start to organize. Your small prayer group has more power than you think. If you enter a neighborhood committee and there's five of you or ten of you in that small group, you can actually have more clout than anybody else in your neighborhood. So we start to organize. And then number uh, D is do. You have to do something. Don't get paralyzed by your analysis. A lie we've swallowed from the, that is deep, from the deepest corner of hell. What difference can one person make? That's a lie of the devil. You know, the insecurity, the darkness, the cleanliness, the violence, the bad roads. Some of you, even in this house, are probably thinking, one vote. What difference can one vote make? How can that change the country? Never underestimate the power of one person who is connected with the Almighty. Me and God make a majority. As long as I'm listening to his mind and doing what he asked me to do, my goodness, me and God make a majority. And it gets even more exciting when a few of us begin to think together. Because the Bible says when two or three are gathered, I'm there in their presence. So begin to do something. Don't, don't worry about the big thing. Just pick one small thing and do something about it. I want us just to pray for a minute. If you could just stand up to your feet right now. I don't know if this message made any sense to people of Nigeria. I don't know if this is... Like I said, I didn't come here with this message in my mind. This message, I went to the Lord after PG asked me to speak. And that came heavily on my heart. I want us to just begin that first thing. If we could just lift up right now a prayer, first of all, for yourself. Just begin to pray that the Lord would just renew you, remove anything the devil has planted, any helplessness, any sense that you don't count. Come on, lift up your voice right now. He's in this house. He wants to hear from the... Just begin to confess. Say, Lord, I gave up on my nation. Lord, I gave up. I didn't think I could count. I was ready to flee Nigeria. But Lord, you planted me here for a reason. Just begin to speak to him right now. Say, Lord, I, I, I'm here, Lord. I, forgive me, Lord, for faulty thinking. Forgive me for faulty thinking. Forgive me for giving up. Forgive me for quitting. Lord, I will not quit. While I'm still here, I will make a difference. Lord, you start, you're going to start hearing my voice in the, in the courts of heaven, knocking for the sake of my nation. Uh, Father, raise up a prayer in me. Raise up a spirit of intercession in me. Nigeria shall not go down while I'm alive. My prayer counts. I can stand and petition the gates of heaven. I can stand and petition on behalf of my people. I can stand in the gap on behalf of this great nation. We bless you, Jesus, that you're here. You're hearing the prayers of your people. You're hearing the prayers of your people. Somebody just begin to pray for Nigeria now. Come on, just stand in the gap right now. Let's pray for this great nation. Come on, just begin to speak over situations that have concerned you. Things you've seen on TV. Things that have worried you. There's a specific thing the Lord has allowed you to see that has concerned you. As we move into this next election. Just begin to say, in Jesus' name, I declare and decree that this nation will be safe. I declare and decree that, Lord, there will be no violence. I declare and decree that your kingdom will come and your will will be done in Nigeria as it is in heaven. I declare and decree that in my lifetime, I will be proud of this nation. I declare and decree that my children will live in a place that they are proud to call their home. I declare and decree that people will no longer flee from this nation. They will come back as people who dreamed. They will celebrate on the streets as they see God beginning to do His thing. I declare and decree that God's people will arise in this nation. They will arise with a prophetic voice. They will stand in unity and God will begin to use their unity. One people speaking the same language, doing the same thing. Nothing will be impossible for us, Lord. We bless you, Jesus. We honor you, Lord. We thank you that you're in this house. We bless you, Lord Jesus. And Father, we come now 
as brothers and sisters, as fellow Africans, standing on behalf of this great nation of Nigeria. We recognize the important role that this nation has in the future of our continent. So many good things you've given to this country. It is rich beyond compare. Father God, I pray that you'd open the eyes of our brothers and sisters, that they will see the beauty that we see when we come into this nation. They would see the amazing potential that this nation has. They would see why the devil would cause despondency because he does not want people to understand how amazing this nation is. What a gifted nation this nation is, Lord. And Father God, we pray that the enemy would not have his way in Nigeria. Ah, Lord, this nation will not be snatched. It will not be snatched. It will not be snatched. It cannot be snatched on our watch, Lord. We declare that, Father God, you're going to allow a spirit of intercession to come upon your people. We declare that there will be unity in the church of Jesus in this nation. Our Lord, we expel the spirit of strife and disunity in Nigeria, in the church of Jesus. We declare that the church will stand as one. And Lord, I speak over your people that, Lord, they will be a political people. Not political in the way of the world. Because the weapons of our warfare are not the weapons of this world. But they are mighty to the tearing down of strongholds. And strongholds will come tumbling down in this nation. We bless you, Jesus. And so, Father God, we stand, we stand, we stand with our brothers and sisters. And we say, bless this great nation. And Lord, we on our side of the world will would, would shout for joy when they are victorious. And we will lift up our banners in the name of our God. We bless you, Jesus. Somebody give glory to Jesus right now. We love you, Lord. Amen. Wow. Praise God. Can you please appreciate Pastor Mariti? Praise God. And so, our Father, we thank you. Thank you for bringing us this word today. Thank you for Pastor Mariti. Thank you for your grace upon his life. Thank you for giving him the courage to be able to speak to us from his heart. Lord, we know that something is breaking out in our nation. We ask, Father, give us the grace to push it through. In the name of Jesus, Amen. let it start from your church. Amen. Cause an awakening in our heart Amen. to see a connection between what we're experiencing in the church and what you want to do in our nation. Let our revival no longer be limited to the four walls of the church. Amen. Let it truly lead to national transformation. Amen. In the precious name of Jesus, Amen. we thank you, Father. We also pray for the nation of Kenya that what you have started, perfect it. Amen. Let that country not go back. Amen. Let it continue to move forward. Amen. Thank you, everlasting Father. We bless your name. In Jesus' precious name. <laughs> Hallelujah. And if you're blessed, please help me appreciate Pastor Marithi one more time. <laughs> Praise God. Please, you may have your seat. And for everyone joining us online, I hope that was a blessing to you. I needed to understand uh, one of the highlights of Exponential Conference also was when uh, Mr. Alder was speaking. I, I mean, highlight for me, when he said the, the, the church, in the church, we emphasize God's promises for divine prosperity for his children. Uh, but when we start to make a connection between how to get more people prosperous and just getting a few people prosperous, which is the, the fastest way to impoverish a people is with a policy. And the fastest way uh, to unleash prosperity on a people is with policies. So, we cannot pray 
and neglect policy making. In fact, our prayer should open our eyes to bad policies that we need to work against so that those policies will not stop our prosperity. And that's why I cannot agree less with the message of this evening. That it's time for you and I, as children of God, to pay more attention to politics. Pay more attention to governance. Pay more attention to nation building. This individualistic mindset and selfish mindset will not take us anywhere. We'll be okay. You know, I wish that a lot of the prayers that we pray in our country will not just be about individual needs. Uh, it's important to pray individual needs. Even Jesus said, when you pray, pray after this man, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, but give us this day, our daily bread is still there. But before we get to this, give us this day, look at all the things that Jesus has said we should pray about. Adoration, our Father who, has, who is in heaven, you know, hallowed be your name. He said, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is turning the earth around, our nation around, to align with heaven's val values, policies, and proposition for mankind. I mean, it's a long journey to give us this our daily bread. But a lot of the time, uh, the way we have configured the, the church, the faith community, is such that after our Father who is in heaven and hallowed be your name. If we have enough patience to say hallowed be your name, after that point, we have to jump to give us this day our daily bread. Yeah. Because our daily bread simply speaks of all of our needs that are personal to us. Everything before then are not personal to us. Your kingdom come is about his will. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Yeah. So, and you and I can champion a kind of church, the kind of Christian or Christianity that is not overtly selfish or that is not just about us. Because that's what we've done and this is where our nation is. When we start to do it better, we definitely will get a better result. Say amen, somebody. Amen. And for all of us Nigerians, whether you are in the room or you are online, I also want to encourage us. This message, uh, you know, uh, cannot be more appropriate at this time because uh, we're just a few days to our uh, uh, national elections. You know, uh, today is the 8th of February and um, on the, is it 24th or so? Yeah, 25th. Yeah, so we're just about two weeks, a little over two weeks to the general elections. Now, the general election is already here. So there are some things that we may not be able to change for this election. But you know the, the normal routine for us as Nigerians? We we'll finish the election, we we'll go back to business as usual. And then when it's a few months to the new election, we we'll start to you know, run around again. Yeah. I wish that many more people will push themselves forward, join the movement, you know, do something. You know, Pastor Moriti gave us the roadmap. Yeah. The one that he said, pray, pray, look, organize, and do. Pray, look, organize, and do. Yeah. You know, at best, you know what we do? We just pray and stop. Yeah. And any set of people that put more responsibility on God and no responsibility on themselves can never get the best of God. That's why we're not getting the best of God. Because we put all the responsibility on God with sometimes no responsibility on us. And any form of, the, any form of gospel that puts all the responsibility of God, no responsibility of man, is not the New Testament gospel. Yeah. In fact, it's the gospel of salvation. It's not the gospel of the kingdom. Because it's only God that can save. But it's not only God that can build the king, his kingdom. We all must partake in kingdom building. Yeah. And there's a difference between the gospel of salvation and the gospel of the kingdom. Yeah. So we have to move beyond salvation. 
to build the kingdom of God. Your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth. Glory to God. You see how strange it sound when Pastor Moritu was speaking about Kenya and the fact that they don't have generators in their home? Yeah. You know, it sounds strange, right? Yeah, because generator is a, is a status symbol in our country. Yeah. That when God has started to bless you, then you have a good generator. <laughs> yeah. In fact, that you can have more than one. It's a sign of blessing. Yeah. That you are now a blessed person. We, have, we need better ways of being blessed. Yeah. Than owning generators. <laughs> Praise God. May bad things not become normal in our lives. Because there are so many bad things that have become normal for us in Nigeria. And it just, I mean, uh, 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 my chief of staff, uh, Pastor Dr. Kola Fahemi, and I, we traveled a few African countries uh, in the last two months or so. We took a trip to Togo and Senegal. And um, I was telling him, these are small African countries that... I mean, forgive the use of the language. Nigeria can buy them. <laughs> Literally speaking, I'm telling you. Because Togo is probably smaller than the smallest state in Nigeria. Yeah. A few, only a few states can be at the level of Togo in terms of landmass. A very small country. Yeah. And you can imagine that they, didn't, they, they are not using generator. It's at that point that you start to think that something is really wrong. <laughs> I said, something is really wrong. Yeah. Bad things have become so normal to us that we don't even think they're not the normal way of life. Let me now shock you. The last African country that I visited in January was Burundi. When my friend, uh, the a mutual friend, with, uh, in fact, I actually met the ordinary troop, Pastor Moriti. When he picked us at the airport, he was telling us they've been going through a lot in the country, all kinds of issues, you know, and all that, and that this Burundi is actually one of the poorest nations currently on earth, one of the poorest in Africa. But I tell you the truth, and I kid you not. How many nights did we spend in Burundi? Three or so. About three nights. The light did not blink once. Yeah. <laughs> and this is a tiny country. This is a, a country that can, you know, Nigeria can sustain them for a century. We paid, you know, we can pay their budgets. You know, we can just underwrite their budget and just move on. We won't even shake if we pick up their budget every year and just sustain them. <laughs> yeah, because what, what, to be, what will it take to pay the budget of Burundi? We pump out 1.3 million barrels of oil a, a day. If we just give them 100,000 barrels, 100,000 liters, you know, 100,000 barrels out of 1.3, they will be okay. Yeah. They will be completely okay, more than okay. Yeah. But they have power. We don't have power. That evil has persisted because good people have done nothing. Yeah. I want to encourage everybody that you should listen to this message again. As you listen to it, get angry. As you listen to it, get annoyed. Until you start to think of what part you need to play. And what you need to do differently. 
as a good person, who will not be silent. Yeah. And I can recommend one, at least one. One. Change your mind about political involvement and join a political party after this election. Yeah. yeah. For everyone who will join a political party after this election, in four years, before the next election, you will have enough influence to influence how things are done there. Yeah. You can imagine if we, outside of mobilizing people to pick up their PVC, their permanent voter card and all, if we move into joining political parties, when you do the primaries where they choose the candidates, you will be able to vote. So we can decide who will vie for office, who each political party will present. Let me say this last thing. We'll take the offering and we'll close this service. When I watch the primary uh, elections, the primaries for the presidential candidates of the two foremost political parties in Nigeria, PDP and APC, I watched, I followed the election. Yeah. That day, the day I watched the two elections of the two parties, and I'm saying this openly, those two political parties cannot change Nigeria. It's not possible. Yeah. It's not possible. Yeah. I'm, I'm saying this for the first time openly. <laughs> APC and PDP cannot change Nigeria. It is not possible. Yeah. Yeah. So, that presupposes that if we're really praying for Nigeria, it's either uh, a part of the prayer, if Nigeria will change, is that the political parties that have the, that have the critical mass of the political class is either they disintegrate or implode or change. If not, they have to fizzle out and we have new political parties before the country can change. But I think one is easier, which is that they implode and rebuild. And that can only happen when they are infiltrated by people who are ready to change Nigeria. I hope you understand what I'm saying. You can't have political parties who cannot even organize primaries with equity and justice in mind. The primary is about highest bidder person who can bring the highest amount of money, that's the person that gets, how can that change the country? It will never happen. We'll just be in the same cycle. Any party that cannot organize in itself to be equitable cannot yield an equitable country. I don't know if you're getting what I'm saying. It's not possible. It's not possible. I think enough is said for tonight. Yeah. May God use you to change this country. Amen. And I must add to it, even in this election, vote wisely, vote your conscience. Yeah. Vote wisely, vote your conscience. This current election does not have a serious promise of being a game-changing election. Yeah. And that's why we need to pray more. I mean, God can use it to bring a change, but let's leave that for another day. Yeah. <laughs> let's leave that for another day. Yeah. But we need to organize ourselves based on what Pastor Moriti taught tonight. It's, uh, it's a bit of a long journey. We're going to get there gradually. It's not a one-day thing. But we need to be aware of our assignment that is clearly cut out for us. Praise God. Again, can you please help me appreciate Pastor Moriti for that work? <laughs>